Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. I'm conscious it's warm in here, but we're going to have a small garden party afterwards. Uh, it's a good excuse to do it. This evening's paper is something of a work in progress, and I'm very grateful to a number of members of this audience, in fact, who've commented on previous versions. They are not responsible for errors. I certainly am. I also utter a word of caution in advance, and that's that my beautiful Erasmian Greek, with which I was brought up, has become very demotic over the last eight years. I will endeavor to stay Erasmian. If I come crashing, I apologize. There's nothing I can do. The focus of this paper is a small group of poems celebrating the achievements of one family, the Oligaithidae of Corinth. Pindar's Olympian 13, and probably also Fragment 122, which he calls a scholion, celebrate Xenophon of Corinth's double victory in the Olympic Stadion and Pentathlon in 464. And both these poems and three fragmentary epinicia by Simonides mention other family members. Half of the Corinthian athletes whose names survive and whose victories may plausibly be placed between 600 and 400 BC were members of this family, and they're in red on the slide. Other names appear in later sources, either in the case of Nicolaidus and Phaedalus and his sons, statue epigrams preserved in the Greek anthology, and by that time attributed to major poets, or in the third century Olympic victors list, Oxyrhynchus 222. Three further festival-related poems by Pindar probably relate to Corinth, although we have no direct information about the identity of the commissioner or the occasion of the commission. Corinth has been seen as the most plausible setting for the Dithyram, Fragment 70C, ever since its first publication in 1919 as part of Oxyrhynchus 1604. When J.B. Bury identified topographical references in the text, the neck in line 14 being the isthmus, and the neighboring rock that is Lord, Acrocorinth, and there's good reason to accept this. Pindar rarely gives topographical and geographical detail, but where he does, he's precise. His treatment of the then new city centre of Cyrene in Pythian 4 and 5 is a case in point. The landmarks, and indeed the direction of approach in fragment 70c, fit a conception of Corinth consistently evident in Pindar's other epinikia. Corinth is approached from the east, in Olympian 8, for example, the Isthmus on the Sea is visited en route to the ridge of Corinth famed for festivals. Now, this would be the natural approach for the honor and of this particular poem, who came from Aegina, but it recurs even when it's counterintuitive. The consequent identification of the sanctuary concerned as that of Demeter and Cory opens new activities, out new avenues for discussion, and I'll return to the cult identifications and possible performance locations proposed later in this paper. The second poem, Fragment 5, is a snippet of an Isthmian Epinikian preserved in Apollonius Discolus's On Syntax. Its three surviving lines contain the earliest reference to the foundation of the Isthmian Games in memory of the child hero Melichetes, Polymon. And finally, Jean Battista D'Alessio has recently identified within Oxyrhynchus 2541 five lines of a hitherto unknown Epinikian for a victory in the Pancratian at the Helotea. Multiple victors, in fact, according to the copyist label. Quite apart from adding new information about the program of the games of Athena Helotus, this ode reinforces their significance as the only local Corinthian festival mentioned in Olympian 13. Until now, this was a singleton reference to the festival, as tantalizing as the other such singleton case in Pindar, in the, the uh, epic corpus, Epinikian corpus, the Thessalian Petraea in Bacchylides 14 although a much greater subsequent interest to scholiasts, as we'll see. Sources can always surprise, and it's not safe to treat any collection of festival-related poetry as if it were a corpus. Nonetheless, Pindar and Simonides' commissions for the Oligaithidae constitute around half of the evidence currently available for Corinthian athletes and festival poetry. A valuable addition to Corinthian prosopography, given the scarcity of pre-Roman epigraphical evidence, when combined with the scholiasts, they allow us to reconstruct three generations of a prominent family, albeit one which may not have survived the Peloponnesian War, since none of their names, and not even that of Xenophon himself, recurs in the lexicon of Greek personal names, nor indeed to those of the other known Corinthian athletes. Moreover, consideration of the implications of the commission and performance of this poetry, and of the language of the best-preserved Olympian 13 and Fragment 122, 
offers a fresh line of approach to local conditions at a time when we're otherwise heavily dependent on the material record. My aim in this paper is therefore to show how the poems for the Oligaithidae reflect the family's engagement on different levels, from the Panhellenic discourse of competition and victory to local religious and social institutions. But I begin with some preliminary remarks on methodology and on Corinth. Recent scholarship has emphasized the importance of an interdisciplinary approach to choral ly lyric, region by region, in order to understand it in the round. Of course, I agree with this, but I'd also emphasize the exploration of dissonance as an essential part of such research. Simply pushing for coherence between disparate strands of evidence runs the risk of circularity or selective interpretation. And it's also important to consider debates within individual fields of study, not least as the poetics and materiality of religion, broadly conceived, are major areas of discussion. To give but one example, the Isthmian Epinikian fragment five, they ordered Sisyphus, son of Aeolus, to raise up a far shining honor for his dead son, Melicertes, is the first extant source to focus on the dead child rather than on the fate of his mother, Eno, which is recounted in Odyssey V, and presumably also in Aeschylus's Apamas. If we read Telef and Donieras as referring to the Isthmian Games, we can understand Pindar's emphasis as a device to set their establishment within the funerary heroic framework of the other great Panhellenic Games, aligning Isthmia with its peers. However, some scholars have preferred to read Geras as a physical monument, citing the prominence of the Pelopean at Olympia or the Ephelian at Nemea. Yet the earliest such monument at Isthmia is Roman, and while it's theoretically possible that something remains to be found in the wider area, and almost impossible to make a negative case in archaeology, any earlier physical marker would not have occupied the same central place as hero shrines elsewhere. The contrast with Nemea is marked, since there the Stadium Bank and the Ophelian Mound evidently deliberately imitated the configuration at Olympia, where an early Helladic III burial mound remained a visible focus of cult. But Nemea was the most recent of the four Panhellenic sanctuaries and festivals. The Isthmian sanctuary had been in existence for at least 500 years when its games were established, traditionally around 582. And its antiquity and place in communal tradition may have offered sufficient guarantee of authenticity and legitimacy or conversely have complicated the acceptance of any new historicizing monument. Pindar fragment five thus works on the level of Panhellenic discourse, and there's no necessity to find a counterpart in Corinthian material practice. My point here concerns methodology. Rather than taking individual media or genres in isolation, I'll try to place pieces of evidence within a matrix of values, experience, and practice to see how they interact and can be understood in each other's terms. There will be gaps that cannot yet be filled and observations that seem impressionistic, but I want to avoid the simplistic comparisons which can result when one seeks supporting or supplementary evidence across media. Turning then to Corinth, even allowing for the vagaries of survival, Corinthian commissions of festival-related poetry seem few given the city's geographical centrality within Pindar's cosmos and her heavy investment in the Isthmian festival. Her links with the West, of course, were close and diverse, not least as the mother city of Syracuse, whose tyrants patronized both Pindar and Bacchylides. Yet Pindar's view comes as much from the east, from the Saronic Gulf, where he had many patrons on Aegina, linking down into the heartland of song, via Bacchylides and Simonides' home island of Caia to the Cyclades. Dorian Corinth, a favorite Pindaric epithet, belonged to this eastern world, as well as being a Peloponnesian polis. In classical times, its Saronic coast was indeed densely settled. And it's in this context that we should understand the parallel Athenian mythology around the Isthmian Games. Theseus's journey to Athens from the Isthmus in Bacchylides 18, which, especially when taken with the return from Knossos in Bacchylides 17, reinforces Athens' southward reach to east and west. Turning north, the name of Xenophon's father and grandfather, Thessalos and Ptoiodorus, imply ties of Xenia in central Greece, the latter, of course, linked to the cult of Apollo Ptoios in Pindar's home city of Thebes. Indeed, Pindar praises the family for its hospitality to foreigners. All of these links are plain in the material and or textual record at least from the 8th century onwards, but it's interesting to find Corinthian connections with cities that were major patrons of Epinikian poets reflected even in the very small collection of commissions that survive. A related point concerns the nature of Corinthian interest in Panhellenic competition. 
Throughout Greece, Panhellenic contests remained high consequence of events for states of all kinds. Public and private expenditure on them generally rose through the 5th and 4th centuries. Corinthians had interests both as organisers of, and we may infer competitors at, the Isthmian festival, but they also had to maintain its prestige and political role against considerable odds. Control of a Panhellenic crown festival by Warren Polis for most, if not quite all, of its history is unique. The Corinthians succeeded in elevating their own local festival into the crown circuit in 582 in a way that not even the Athenians quite managed with the great Panathenaea. Yet following major architectural investment at the city and sanctuary through the 6th century, selectivity was increasingly necessary, especially as 5th century conflicts took their toll on Corinthian finances. At Ismia, the first temple of Poseidon that you see in the slide was destroyed by fire between 470 and 450. Clearance began quickly, but its replacement was not completed until the end of the 5th century, whereupon it burnt down again in 390 and was not rebuilt before the end of the 4th century, a delay which surely reflects the economic drain of the Peloponnesian War and its aftermath. So there was a working temple at this Panhellenic festival site for only 20 of 150 years, yet continuously functioning and indeed expanding athletic facilities very close to the ruins. And this is how close they are, the first stadium starting line and the temple. You, you can't hide that ruin. Priority was given to providing for the growing crowds by extending both the assembly areas around the altar and the approach roads, conveniently, of course, using up fire debris. In Pindar's time, the Isthmian Games were flourishing and a source of great political capital. For much of the 5th century, Corinth had the diplomatic weight and resources to cover weaknesses in her conduct of foreign policy and to exploit assets such as control of these games. But by the start of the 4th, her resources were depleted and her cultural capital was fast diminishing as the smaller cities around her, Epidaurus, Phlius and Cleonae, gained from the changing balance of power and began major building programs. At Nemea and Epidaurus, these featured lavish athletic complexes which alluded in form to Olympia thus rooting new claims in the old structures of interstate competition. Now, I don't want to stray too far from the period of our poetry, but I would emphasize the fragility of Corinth's position in the long term. The relatively few visible signs of Corinthian investment in victory celebration must be set against the probably substantial burden on the local elite of maintaining the sanctuary and the festival. As we've seen, it's hard to find 6th or 5th century Corinthian victors in any of the crown games. With the exception of, exception of a single name in Oxyrhynchus 222, we can identify only the Oligaithidae via their poetry and at least four individuals from three statue inscriptions, two at Olympia and one location unknown. Olympia apart, the lack of early victor lists leaves us reliant on the chances of archaeology or the biographical or material interests of our literary sources. A scholiast on Isthmian 111 mentions Isthmia Kaya Nakarovai, but we know nothing more about them, and there's very little evidence with which to reconstruct victor lists. While it's tempting to suppose that Corinthians favoured their home games, they're not very visible as participants or victors. They were likely responsible for a few small dedications marked, marking victories won elsewhere. Uh, Panathenaic Amphrey found at Corinth and Ismia, the earliest, as you see here, by the Cleophrides painter or his circle, round about 470, being close in date to our poetry. And Halteris dedicated a dismir by a pentathlete around 600 to 550 and inscribed in Corinthian script. The name of the festival is lost. But with the exception of this male head with a victor's fillet from Ismir, again circa 470, the earliest of a series, we lack identifiable athletics related statuary or other monuments in the Corinthia. Of course, the scarcity of inscriptions, other than on vases, leaves us unable to determine whether specific meaning was attached to generic imagery. And the subsequent history of key, key sites also played a role. In central Corinth, many fragments of statue bases in deposits related to the Roman sack of 146 are impossible to date or interpret. Yet while Pausanias describes the Isthmian sanctuary as adorned on one side with statues of victorious athletes, preserved bases on the north side of the Temenos and by the stadium, as you see here, as those by the racetrack at Corinth date by context and technique only from late classical onwards. In short, and with all due caution, a small number of near contemporary dedications indicate athletic interest, but there's no real indication of a culture of commemoration among the Corinthian elite in the early 5th century, 
and no clear expectation of the path that Xenophon was likely to follow when he decided to celebrate his victories. The local significance of this observation becomes clear if we compare neighbouring Sicyon, and just a, a reminder that there's really nothing to divide the two cities uh, along this long coastal plain. Setting aside the name as the sole surviving word of a fragment of Simonides, Sicyon features only in Nemean 9, which celebrates the chariot victory of Hieron of Syracuse's general, Chromios of Etna, in the games of Adrastus soon after 476. The poem opens with the victor's passage home. Let us go in revelry, Kumasumen, from Apollo at Sicyon Muses to the newly founded Etna, where the wide open gates are overwhelmed by guests to Chromius' blessed home. On the assumption that this commerce is a creation of memory for a Sicilian audience, the performance or reperformance of Nemea 9 has been analysed almost entirely in Sicilian terms. Hence, it's been taken with Nemean 1 for another, perhaps slightly earlier, victory by Chromius at Nemea as a case study in Pindaric intertextuality and the reception of Pindar's poetry by overlapping audiences. But it may be premature to dismiss a Sicyonian role, not least as the choice of festival is interesting. I myself originally saw diplomacy as the main factor behind Chromius' decision to celebrate a non-crown victory. Yet he evidently had no qualms about celebrating his previous Nemean victory, and why choose Sicyon, given the range of local festivals mentioned by Pindar as attracting crown victors? In a rare discussion of this question, Thomas Hubbard argued for strengthening ties with the Peloponnese, a source of new settlers for the new city of Etna, and the broad attraction of the myth of Adrastus to which Pindar devoted considerable attention. This is plausible, but is it quite enough? Nemea 9 presents Sicyon as the source of the prized silver bowls in which wine will be mixed for Chromis's Victor Symposium, a rich prize even at a time when metal prize vessels were becoming widespread, and on occasion indeed recycled between festivals, perhaps in the context of civic liturgy. Sicyon had long been associated with horse breeding and racing. At Iliad 123, for example, Echepolus, son of Anchises, brought himself out of going to Troy by giving Agamemnon his prize mare, Aethi. This was a Corinthian interest too, logically so given the rich coastal plain. Consider the character of Poseidon and the role of horse racing at Ismir, with chariot dedication stored in the archaic temple. Pindar's choice of the bridle and bit as example of Corinthian inventiveness in Olympian 13. And the fact that the statue which Phaedalus dedicated at Olympia depicted his extraordinary mare, Aura, who won her race despite throwing her rider. At Sicyon, however, the ruling elite was conspicuously engaged in equestrian and especially chariot competition. Myron and Cleisthenes were both Olympic victors, and the latter also won at Delphi. And post-tyrannical evidence includes a fragmentary base or stele of the first quarter of the 5th century, with a list of the many victories won by one Agathacus as restored, at Delphi, Isthmia, Nemea, Sicyon and Athens. The events are not preserved. In this respect, the Sicyonian elite were closer to their Western counterparts than their Corinthian neighbours. And since it remained generally true that victory in costly events like chariot races could cement political status as home, at home, as is very clear in Athens where the prosopographical record is precise, I note the continued association of Sicyon with the finest luxury horses. In the 4th century, for example, Demosthenes rebukes Midias for the ostentatious display of driving a pair of white horses from Sicyon. Now, at the risk of treating complex political, cultural and religious connections very superficially, I also note the role of Delphi from the end of the 6th century. Pindar's innovative juxtaposition of the defeat of Persians and Carthaginians at Salamis and Plataea, Cumae and Himera in Pythian I echoes the placing of victory offerings at Delphi. Delphic performance settings featuring allusions to the Siphonian treasury have been explored by Lucia Thanasaki in three Sicilian odes, Pythian VI, Olympian II and Isthmian II. And for Sicyon, political relations apart, it is worth returning to the Western Greek style of the sculptures of the Sicyonian Monopterus, probably commissioned by the last tyrant Aeschines. Doubts about the attribution focus on the lack of local stylistic parallels, but we know so little of Sicyonian sculpture, and there's no single convincing Western home, even though Western influence is perfectly plain. The nexus of connections focused on Delphi makes the Sicyonian case plausible. So in short, even a superficial glance indicates sharp differences in elite attitudes and connections over the relatively small geographical distance between Sicyon and Corinth. 
So let's now turn to the Corinthian poetry. Olympian 13 is one of Pindar's longest epinikia. At first sight, it seems, at least by Pindar's high standards, a rather workmanlike combination of praise of the city, the victor, and his family, which perhaps understandably has attracted few commentators. The traits attributed to Corinth, justice, good governance, peace and inventiveness, are familiar, not least from Pindar's treatment of other cities, oligarchies in particular. Even thriving Ares is no surprise in the light of the new Simonides and the Corinthians' own self-perception. Five war-related epigrams were subsequently credited to Simonides with varying degrees of plausibility. In fact, Ascolius to Olympian 13, line 23, is one of three sources for a poem to which we'll return, an epigram on a picture in the Temple of Aphrodite depicting the women of Corinth praying to the goddess to inspire their men with zeal for battle on behalf of the Greeks and their close-fighting fellow citizens. The poetic highlight of Olympian 13 is surely Pindar's treatment of the myth of Bellerophon. I suggested earlier that emphasis on the child Melikertes in the Epinikian Fragment 5 placed the Isthmian Games within a Panhellenic mythological frame. Thomas Hubbard has made a similar case for Bellerophon in Olympian 13. Pindar reconciles the different versions of the story then in circulation, notably in Iliad 6, while balancing Bellerophon's human endeavour with Athena's divine benefaction to offer an appropriate analogy for athletic victory. The Bellerophon story is a rare instance, instance of a Corinth-related myth with substantial international reach. There's little other Corinthian material for a panhellenically-minded poet like Pindar to draw on. Pindar liked to use Homer, and by contrast with Bacchylides, was less keen on distinctively local myth. Yet the definably Corinthian, or more, more loosely Ephyrian, presence in Homer is notoriously slight, Hence Martin West's argument that Eumelus's Corinthia Ka was a post-Homeric attempt to establish a more distinctive and expansive Corinthian local tradition. West dates the Corinthia Ka after the mid-6th century, chronologically closer to Pindar than previously assumed, with two other poets, poems which may form part of the same cycle, the Titanomachia and Evropia, slightly earlier. There's nothing to suggest that Pindar picked up on this. His interests were not so local but the scoliasts on Olympian 13 certainly did. We owe the longest extant fragment of Eumelus to one of them. As a result, those seeking to reconstruct classical Corinthian religion from textual evidence face a large gap between the little that poets like Pindar tell us directly and with a Panhellenic focus and the mass of local detail accrued by the scoliasts often long after the event. We have two skewed sets of evidence with little in between. Olympian 13 is also unusual for its mention of three generations of victors in one family and for the emphasis placed on multiple victories from its very first word, Thris Olympianikan. Other cases of supplementary victors show similarities, though no exact parallels. Olympian 9 for the wrestler Ephemostos of Opus, which names a second victor, Lambromachos, a relative according to Ascolius, and Pythian 10, which includes the father of the boy victor, Hippocleus of Thessaly, are also isolated commissions in their regions, but name only one other person and concern contact sports where training, so intergenerational influence, is to be expected. Isthmian III, for the charioteer Melissus of Thebes, names his ancestor Cleonymus, but in a more general evocation of family skill and fortune. Nemian X, for the wrestler Theos of Argos, comes closer in naming three ancestors and enumerating countless victories in both local and Panhellenic games. And that's an attempt to quantify, and the, the color coding applies across the, uh, the two poems. Pindar is usually precise about numbers of victories, and Olympian 13 is an exceptional case of a very high number, I reckoned over 60, combined with deliberate imprecision, perhaps to protect the poet from the hubris of excessive lists. He presents countless victories as like pebbles of the sea. Yet Nemean 10, which has far fewer victories, celebrates prima facie a victory at the Argive Horea, not a crown event, and has plausibly been interpreted as a celebration of a new cult order after the Battle of Sipia and the Servile Interregnum. Its local impact was likely rather different from that of Olympian 13. Most interestingly, Pindar's numerous odes for Aegean more often than not, list supplementary victories within the family, 
they were in fact fractionally more supplementary than primary victors, and carefully enumerated victory catalogues are also significantly more common in this group. David Fern has rightly drawn attention to Olympian 13 as the best parallel for this distinctive combination of traits, yet still important differences remain. On Agena 2, we're generally dealing with cross-generational training in contact sports. And since the Aganite nodes were commissioned by several of the elite clans and families who ran the religious and political life of the island, victory commemoration likely formed part of a shared framework of competition, expressing creative tension between families as much as the usual articulation between individual, family, and polis. Corinth, too, was an oligarchy, but the oligithidae stand out for their athletic talents and their commissioning of poetry. Xenophon, said Pindar, had achieved what no mortal man had done before. One would therefore assume a high risk of thonos or envy. But the only direct re re reference to this is a prayer to avert the thonos of Zeus, the risk of a mortal seeming to usurp the divine, and not envy between mortals. Indeed, moral containment pervades Olympian 13. As we've seen, Pundar holds back from detailing the massive victor lists, and there is a direct plea for moderation. In each matter, there comes due measure, and it's best to recognize what is fitting. This is really very different in tone from Pindar's emphasis on the phthonos suffered by athletes like the Athenian, in fact, the Alcmeonid, charioteer, Megacles, and Pythian Seven, despite the great achievements of his family, which included, of course, a major contribution to the restoration of Apollo, Temple of Apollo at Delphi. Phthonos is not universally mentioned. Uh, it rarely appears in the Aegean nodes, for example, although if it was endemic among the island's competitive elite, it may not have been a matter of a specific warning in a shared medium like Epinikian poetry. So what was early 5th century Corinthian society like? And what risks did Xenophon run in presenting his family in this way? Different strands of evidence combined to suggest that the city was as vulnerable as its peers to fracture an internal rivalry. Take its constitution. From the limited surviving textual and epigraphical evidence, Nicholas Jones has convincingly reconstructed a system of eight territorial phyli, each bisected into hemiogdoa and with an unknown but small number of units with military functions, termed triacadas. Cutting across this territorial organization were the tribes and fratries to which citizens were individually assigned. The Dorian triad of Dimanis, Hules, and Pamphi Pamphiloi, plus a fourth, the Aeores. The territorial foundation of this system finds echoes in local variation in the archaeological record, which I can only sketch here. There is many, many more than one new lecture in the sheer wealth of data from recent rescue excavations. It's clear that the Astio at ancient Corinth had a number of dependent centers with differently structured local settlement systems. Around Ismia, for example, there's a large settlement at Kromna, the geographical center of the Corinthia, with dependent cemeteries and a satellite settlement on the Rachi above the shrine. And a dense string of sites along the Saronic Gulf Coast includes the ports of Schinus and Kenkrio. The earliest sub-regional ethnic or demotic, Soligeatus, on an archaic bronze bowl dedicated at Ismia, comes from this area and confirms that personal identity could be expressed on a sub-polis level. Equally, the southwest Corinthia, cut by the principal passes into the Argolid, has at least two centers with satellite villages, Thenea, or Kome, according to Aristotle, with a classical walled settlement and cemetery, and modern Kivoria. Almost all cultivable parts of the Corinthia were exploited, and often with substantial centers rather than isolated farmsteads. Growing evidence for extensive cemeteries suggests that while the traditional picture of relatively consistent investment in graves, sarcophagi with small numbers of vases, remains broadly right, through the 6th and 5th century, a small number of distinctive burials and markers appear scattered through the region. The early 6th century painted sarcophagus from Phaneromini, the quaroi from Tenea of the third quarter of the 6th century, a late 6th century bronze tripod in an extensive cemetery exposed during the construction of the high-speed railway on the northern coastal plain, and in the north cemetery, an early 5th century panoply burial with a bronze helmet best paralleled in a cache of armour dedicated at Olympia by the Argives as spoils from the Corinthians after an unknown battle. The circumstances of this man's death are unknown, but the commemoration of personal status via a combination of armour and an athletic strigil chimes with Pindar. A new archaeology of classical Corinthia is some way off. 
though we increasingly have the material to write it. But there are clear signs of local variation and complexity that give substance both to the Constitution and to one further piece of evidence. Pindar's dithyram, fragment 70c, has plausibly been taken as evidence of a dithyrambic contest likely held in the sanctuary of Demeter and Cori, where we have epigraphical evidence for the worship of Dionysus. One possible candidate for the place of performance is the theatral area in combination with the court on the middle terrace. The court is indeed small for a full attic-style chorus, but we know nothing of the scale of events in Corinth other than the word that the word philon in line 18 of the dithyram may suggest a chorus drawn from Corinth's tribes. This dithyram clearly shows that Corinth was among a significant number of polis, including Thebes and Athens, which engaged in the ritual summoning of Dionysus into the public religious arena to address questions of cleansing and regeneration, to promote social cohesion and to deal with stasis. Corinth was also one of several claimants for the place of origin or first performance of the dithyram. The claim, in fact, comes at Olympian 13, 18 to 19, whence came the delights of Dionysus with the ox-driving dithyram? Answer, Corinth. There's no reason to favour Corinth over Naxos, Thebes, or any other city whose claims Pindar makes elsewhere. I merely note that this further link reinforces a connection between Xenophon's ode and civic practice. The striking point about fragment 70C, however, is the prominent desire for stasis to cease. There are several ways to fill the lacuna that I've highlighted, but pavzaito or kataluoito may be preferable to mergenoito if the implication just below in the text is that weapons have already been taken up. But was this a real stasis? It could be seen in purely religious terms as an instruction not to resist the army of Dionysus, Perhaps more plausible is a generic reflection of tensions within society, and finding a specific event behind it is probably unnecessary. The best candidate is Thucydides' report in Book 1, 105 to 6, that in 460 the Corinthian army failed to hold Megara against the scratch Athenian force of the very old and very young, to the great shame of their elders. The reaction, as he describes it, is the closest we come to stasis in the sources, and the date is about right. But there's no need to push this line of argument to appreciate the complementarity between Pindar's praise of Corinthian order, justice, and peace in Olympian 13 and his dithyram, written for a ritual designed to promote cohesion and minimize internal conflict. So let's return to the social risks taken by Xenophon and consider questions of performance, reperformance, and audience, and the significance of the parallel commission of the Epinikian and the Scolian fragment 122. Uh, this, I think, is one of the more convincing cases for a double commission, though an element of uncertainty remains. An Epiniki no ode was no ordinary dedication. The experience of a first performance, the elevated language, dance, and choral singing would probably have been rare for most Corinthians, unlike Aegeanetans or Syracusans, who could compare poetry and performance more or less frequently. We don't know where Olympian 13 was first performed at Ismir, in the city centre, or even at Demeter and Cori, in which case some of what follows may apply at this stage too. But we can be more confident about re-performance, where a likely sympotic setting makes the link with the scholion clearer. And of course, we must consider the continuing resonance of the poem in Corinthian society. Did the social bounding of these occasions contribute to the message? There are, of course, numerous potential settings for the re-performance of poetry of this kind, from private homes to the small dining rooms at a number of Corinthian sanctuaries, the Perichora, for example, or as we see here, the cave dining rooms at Ismir. I focus on Demeter and Cori because of the unique scale of provision for dining and the suggestive evidence for particular kinds of socially significant association. What follows is therefore speculative, but I hope not wildly so. The sanctuary of Demeter and Cori was distinguished by a uniquely dense and extensive array of dining rooms on its lower terrace, each with its own cooking and washing facilities, plus a smaller number of sitting rooms. Provision began in the late 6th century, mostly with simple dining rooms, as you see here, and it grew more elaborate through the 5th, with then a massive expansion following from the 4th onwards. It's rare to find multiple small but self-sufficient rooms used to provide large-scale capacity for dining, even though this gave flexibility to accommodate gatherings of different size and composition. Family groups have been claimed, but there are some difficulties with this. 
not least the wartime fracturing of family lines to which I've alluded. Other possibilities, not at all mutually exclusive, include constitutionally defined groups, social classes as age sets, or religious or other associations. There's a wealth of epigraphic evidence for associations across late archaic and classical Greece, albeit poorly understood. Take, for example, this bronze inscription of about 500 BC from a sanctuary at Thekrasa in inland Sicyon, which sets out regulations for members of a Hestiatorian, in fact, it's the earliest occurrence of the word, and names 73 members without their ethnics, so presumably local residents. There are many possibilities for Demeter and Cory, and the material record is itself suggestive. Of particular significance to the present argument is the largest collection of statuary less yet found in the Corinthia. Between 132 and 147, mostly half to three-quarter life-size terracotta images dating from the end of the 7th century to the 4th or early 3rd, now fully published by Nancy Bukhithis. Most are male youths wearing plain, red-brown, floor-length hematia draped in a local fashion evident in ritual scenes in vase painting from the mid-7th century onwards. A few are nude with a casually flung cloak, but all hold offerings, arms extended. Bukhudi suggests that they may depict an age category of 14 to 16-year-olds, joined from the mid-5th century onwards by a smaller number of pre-pubescent -pre -pre temple boys. Women are so few that they may be de deities rather than mortals. There's an obvious contrast between the limited range of sculptural types and conservative iconography confined to just one Corinthian city, city sanctuary and the individualism and variety present, for example, on the Athenian Acropolis. In Corinth, statuary of a specific kind was used to commemorate one particular form of ritual with the implication that other forms were not so marked. Conversely, certain highly ritualized vase iconography, as the Frauenfest, did not translate into sculpture. Given the clear age categor categories depicted, Bukhida suggests that the youths may be linked to a maturation or initiation rite of some kind, and the younger boys to notions of nurturing a healthy family, although, of course, there's no direct textual evidence for either. The conformity suggests a rite pertaining to a group, and the relatively small number of statues over the long period depicting roles present only to a limited extent in the much more diverse collection of figurines, the activities of the oligarchic elite. And at least one Corinthian chose to represent himself in this way at Delphi, in an example of the long robe type of around 470, 460. It's against this background of drinking, dining, and age classes that I turn to the scholion, fragment 122. Athenaeus calls it an encomium, but I'll use Pindar's own language. This is the first use of scholion, and if it carries its later sense, it implies, of course, a symposiastic context. Pairings of epinikia and scholia are not unusual. The genres relate to the symposium in interestingly different and complementary ways. However, scholarship on fragment 122 has been unhelpfully sidetracked by the question of whether the poem gives evidence for sacred prostitution in Corinth. I think that it proves absolutely nothing, and I agree with the view that we've been misled by a circular argument. Fragment 122 and Simonides' epigram on the women of Corinth, which I referred to earlier, appear in the same part of Athenaeus' Hypnosophistae, and Athenaeus' source, likely on both, was Chameleons on Pindar. Hence, Athenaeus is now the only extant source for the epigram, and there are, there are three, to term the Corinthian women involved prostitutes. The epigram is of considerable interest for the light it sheds on Aphrodite's role as city protector, but the idea, flowing from Chameleon, that a common old custom of sacred prostitution can be read across the two poems and a mutually assured interpretation, I think is very misleading. In fragment 122, sacred prostitution is not, I think, the point. The performance is emphatically not the post-victory orgy, nor should we struggle to find a role for real, real women at the symposium, as some have tried to do. In what I find the most helpful analysis to date, Anne Pippin Burnett emphasizes the formal characteristics of the scholion, the sharp twists and turns which articulate the random passage of an impromptu drinking song. At these points, participants' reactions are challenged. So we begin with a mature male audience, in effect, invited to imagine the best party possible. What else would you expect from a victor like Xenophon? And then reminded of their own passage into adulthood and their lost youth. Then a challenge, is this really appropriate? And then the shift to a moral reflection, now lost, but perhaps none too serious. 
and then to a quite bizarrely expressed form of dedication. Um, how, many, how many girls are behind all those limbs? I have no idea whether Xenophon actually dedicated girls to Aphrodite as a pious obligation, but this is not what the poem is about. Rather, the direct engagements of the symposiasts in acts of collective and rather humorous imagination draws us into the shared experience of men of similar age and class, a known point of commemoration at Demeter and Cory. So was the context of performance a form of protection for Xenophon, the family praise of the Epinikian being softened by the male bonding of the scholion? Another point of connection between Xenophon as Panhellenic athlete and as Corinthian aristocrat is Pindar's reporting in Olympian 13 of his seven victories in the games for Athena Helotis, the only local event named. Scholiast to this passage focused on the torch race ritual at the Helotia, which they explained in terms of the character of Helotis and the significance of fire in her myth. According to one of the three reported traditions, Helotis and her sister Cotaito burned to death in the temple of Athena when they took refuge from the invading Dorians. But this can't be the whole story. Xenophon won seven victories, so either the torch race was not confined to an age group or the games included other events of no interest to the scholiasts. And here the new Epinikian within Oxyrhynchus 2541 comes to the rescue with the Pancratian, filling the gap left by the bias of the scholiasts. The inclusion of a torch race within games which also featured standard Panhellenic events shows how these games were embedded within Corinthian ritual practice something which we generally miss in Pindar's discussion of local festivals elsewhere. And it helps to explain why this festival was included among Xenophon's achievements, balancing Panhellenic success with honour as a pious citizen. Well, was the Helotia unusual in Corinth? Setting aside the Isthmian Games and a putative local contest at a village Pereon in the area of Perea, infor in inferred by Rudolf Wachter from this Penduscufia plaque with a likely victor's dedication, our evidence for local Corinthian contests concerns torch races or rites for female deities. Those in honour of Helotis's sister, Cotaito, were apparently satirised in Eupolis's Bapti at the end of the 5th century. Cotaito has plausibly been linked with a sacred spring shrine behind, beside Temple Hill in central Corinth, which underwent a considerable development and expansion early in the 5th century, perhaps as part of a concerted attempt to memorialise aspects of civic history. Another dimension appears in the Scolia to Juvenal 2, 91-2, where rites with torches in honour of Cotaito are explained as men dressed as women performing lewd dances. Well, this is a late source. It's hard to interpret. I merely note the possibility that Corinthian rites included satirical aspects akin to the common juxtaposition of padded dancers and deities in Corinthian vase painting or Aeschylus' fragmentary satyr play, the Theori or Ismias Dive the plot of which involved the satyr chorus attempting to deceive Dionysus and switch their participation in the Isthmian Games from dancing to athletics. To the very limited extent that we can assess the corpus of satyr plays, games were po a popular subject. The Theoroi may even be the earliest example, close in date to Olympian 13. Overall, though, we lack the evidence to assess the place of role reversal within celebrations, otherwise formally grounded in city history, this is something we just have to leave hanging for the moment. Another race, perhaps in honour of Cory, is depicted on an early 5th century cotterly from the sanctuary of Demeter and Cory. On one side, a crowned female head is identified as Peri Fata, uh, as restored, and on the other, two running figures. Only one is legible, a male wearing just a short cloak, carrying a baton in one hand and something else in the other. The scene looks agonistic and must somehow be relevant to the cult. It recalls and may help to explain the terracotta statues considered earlier, and it potentially thickens the age-class ties emphasised in the context of performance. There's no space in the sanctuary for, of Demeter and Cory for such a race, but there is a good city centre candidate in the race course under the Roman Forum, with a relatively short track and widely spaced front and back toe grips of the starting line, suitable for a striding stance, have been widely noted as appropriate for torch races or races in armour as well as for conventional races. The significance of the adjacent area for contact sports oops, here, has also been observed by D'Alessio in discussion of the Pancratian in the Helotia. Well, without Pindar and the combination of references to the Helotia in Olympian 13 and the new Epinikian, 
we would have struggled to interpret an odd local ritual. For now, we can only pose the question of the role of these other events in establishing the citizen credentials of someone like Xenophon. But as a final point, I draw attention to further aspects of the material record which provide evidence of contemporary attitudes distinct from the Scolias tradition. Some 30 years ago, Sharon Herbert published a group of small red-figure Corinthian bell craters, likely trophies or dedications, which commonly depict athletic or dramatic scenes, including torch races, in two instances at least, also with a satyr, perhaps alluding to Dionysus. Production ran from the third quarter of the fifth century until the mid-fourth. We can't associate these craters with any particular race, but both the choice of subject and the medium mark them out. Red figure is a hard technique to achieve successfully given the chemistry of Corinthian clays, so the choice likely reflects a deliberate attempt to differentiate this body of imagery from the Corinthian norm. Secondly, ostensibly local imagery did, in a few instances, achieve visibility in a Panhellenic context. I've already noted the terracotta youth from Delphi, and I add now a dedication from Ismir of a bronze figure depicting a nude runner, perhaps a torch racer, with a cloak similar to the Demeter and Cory statues, but with short hair. So to sum up, I've tried to show how a Corinthian aristocrat like Xenophon used poetic commissions to reinforce his position in Corinthian society by placing himself quite subtly within domestic Corinthian liturgical and religious contexts, as well as the more familiar world of the Panhellenic Agon. The body of lyric poetry, securely or plausibly linked to classical Corinth, may be small, but via its direct contact, content and the heuristic exercise of asking broader Pindaric questions of the Corinthian record, I think it's unexpectedly revealing of Corinthian society. Thank you very much. <laughs>